chapter 3. I'm going to read some verses in here that's very familiar to most of us. If you've been saved, any length of time. Now, the book of Romans, chapter 3. And while you turn there, I just want to go ahead and refresh your memory about Sunday morning, unless the Lord leads otherwise. I'll be preaching on the thought of why. Why? Uh, why did God choose to, why did God allow Stephen to be stoned to death and then uh, spare Peter's life? See? And uh, why, does, why does something happen to this particular individual? And it seems like the other, another person, that nothing happens. And uh, it's a great question in the Bible. Why? Uh, so we'll be dealing with that. Why? You know, ever thought about this? Why is it sometimes you see some of the God's chosen people, I mean, dedicated Christians, go through some of the roughest things in life, and here's somebody over here not even saved, and it seems like they don't have a problem in the world. And uh, that book, of, the book of Proverbs, had a lot to say about that too. But why? 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 And uh, why would God allow a little baby to get sick and maybe even die? And things of that sort. So we're going to be looking at that fall on Sunday morning. Hope you'll be here. Why? Now tonight we're going to look in chapter 3 of the book of Romans. And I'll read the verses and then I'll give you the title of the message, okay? In, in chapter 3, verse 10, it says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, what's the next two words? Not one. There's none right with God. Not one. You believe that? That's what it says. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Now here in the book of Romans, Paul is addressing the reality of the uh, Jews and Gentiles. And, and if you read it carefully, what he's saying here is, see, a lot of Jews had the idea they were going to go to heaven because they were just Jews. And uh, he said, that's not true. Nobody goes to heaven because of their heritage or their lineage or their nationality. I even had a Jewish a friend of mine who worked in Walterboro. I called his name. Many of you would know the name. And he, he told me that. I asked him if he, you know, he died to go to heaven. He said, yes. I said, what do you base that on? He said, because I'm a Jew. And we're God's chosen people. And I said, that ain't what the Bible says. Of course, a Jew doesn't accept the New Testament. So I went to the Old Testament and showed him. And uh, as far as I know, he never got saved. And so that's what that's talking about there. In other words, Paul is saying here, there's no one anywhere in any way that is born right with God. And, uh, and even after you get saved, you still are imperfect because of, of your flesh and my flesh. And that's why the, the finished work of Calvary and the finished work of the resurrection makes us what, what, what we are because of him. Amen? And so I want to, uh, the, the thought tonight is this, this phrase, no one, no one. You'll find the word all <laughs> several hundred times in the Bible. In other words, in every verse you find the word all, it means all. Okay? And when you find the word none, it means none, no one. So we're going to look through some verses. And I, I, just for time's sake, I'm just going to try to keep it right here in the New Testament. And we're going to sort of make our way through here about this fact of no one. In Matthew chapter 6, if you'll turn there, and I'm going to get as far as I can tonight with this thought. And uh, chapter 6 in verse number uh, 24. Notice what it says in Matthew 6, 24. What's the first two words? No man. You could say no one. Could you say that? I mean the same thing, wouldn't it? Okay. No man can serve what? Two masters. Uh, woo. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. So here we find out that no one 
can serve two masters. No one. Doesn't matter who you are. You cannot serve two masters. And the reality of this here, here is, when we say that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, uh, you better make sure you know what you're saying. Is he, the, is he the Lord of your life? If he is, that means he's your master. That means that everything that you do, you do according to his will. Everything. Not just a few things, but everything. Because you cannot serve two masters. And I can't, you can't, and, and so it won't work. He said, you're going to either hate one or love the other. And here's, that's why Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciples, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. He's saying here, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to follow me, now you can be saved, listen to me, you can be saved and not be a good disciple. You can be saved and not be a good Christian. Amen? I mean, you're saved, going to heaven when you die, amen? And, but the fact is, no man can serve two masters. And we'll, if we were to be honest with ourselves, quite often, probably just about every day, we find ourselves serving ourselves ahead of him. We become our master. And I think uh, I've emphasized this over the years. My biggest, the person I have the most problem with is me. The one that gives me the most trouble is me. I heard the old song, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And so uh, it's, uh, it's the truth is that no man can serve two masters. Matter of fact, uh, Jesus goes on to say that uh, uh, where your treasure is, what else will be there? Your heart will be there. So where's your treasure? That's why Jesus should be the treasure of your heart. And so day in and day out, we understand that. Go over, if you would, over to Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 36. Matthew 24 and verse 36. Notice this now. Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour knoweth what? No man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Wow. Here's the second thought. No one knows when Christ will return. No one knows that. As a matter of fact, according to the words of Jesus... He has actually allowed the Father to keep that from him. That's hard for us to understand, didn't it? We say all, they're all one. And so Jesus right now is waiting for that day, waiting for that time, that when the Father will say to the Son, go get your bride. We're wait, you and I who are saved, we're waiting for that soon return of Christ. And we are in his family. We're the bride waiting on the groom. And uh, we're the sheep waiting on the great good shepherd, the great shepherd. And, but nobody knows the hour nor the time he's coming back. And over the years in my lifetime, I think there's been three times in my lifetime where uh, so-called prophets have said he is going to come on this date. Well, if any man says he's going to come on this day, you can mark it down. He's not coming on that day. He's not coming on that day. Jesus said that when he comes back, he said it's going to come as a thief in the night. He's going to come when you least expect it. He's going to come maybe in a, such an hour that you think not a moment. And we know that's going to be the, the, the resurrection of the dead in Christ and then the rapture of the saints. I'm looking forward to him coming back, aren't you? He may come back tonight. Now, here's the thought of that. Since you and I believe he's coming back, and he tells us to look for that, but we don't stop what we're doing and looking. We're supposed to be busy doing what we should as Christians, but looking for that blessed hope, expecting it to come. If you knew the Lord was coming back, say, at 1130 tonight, what would you really do? If you knew he was coming back, say, Saturday, would you quit your job? Probably would. <laughs> but we don't know when he's coming back. He said, there'll be one in the field. One left at home and one will be taken and one will be left. And in other words, there'll be people, there'll be families divided when he comes back because the wife will be saved, the husband may be lost, or the husband saved, the wife lost, or parents saved and the kids are lost. My point is this. Are you saved? 
Because if you're not saved, you're playing a Russian roulette with the coming of Jesus Christ. He's coming back. Today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. Amen. So no one, no one can serve two masters. No one knows when Christ will return. So we must look for that blessed hope and live like we should. And then over in the book of Luke, if you'll turn there in chapter 10, we find something else about this no one. Luke chapter 10, and this will give you a good little trip through your Bible tonight. Yeah, your daily Bible reading. Chapter 10, and uh, <clears throat> verse number 20. Luke 10, 20. Notwithstanding, uh, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written where? In heaven. Aren't you glad of that? In other words, when I look at this, do not, listen, do not, no, there, they are, there, no one rejects being saved. That's what he says here. He said, do not rejoice because uh, uh, the spirits are subject to you, but because your names are written in heaven. I have never met anyone, no one has ever told me I don't want to be saved. Uh, I'm saved, but I don't, I don't want to be saved anymore. I, I renounce Christ. I don't want to be saved anymore. I don't want, to, I don't want salvation. You can't. I've never met anyone who said, I don't, I don't. I'm glad I'm, I, I'm a Christian, but I don't want to be a Christian anymore. Every saved person I've met that's really been saved are glad they're saved. Aren't you? No. Now, here's why. Because if you know you're really, if you know you've been born again, you won't regret it. Now, that's not saying that there'll be might times in your life you might say, well, <laughs> uh, I've known preachers that say, boy, I tell you what. This, I'm tired of preaching. I've met somebody. Well, I'm tired of going to church. I'm, I, but I've never met anybody saying I'm tired. I'm tired of Jesus Christ. No, I've never heard anybody say that. And so I'm glad that no one, no one regrets being saved because your names are written down the, in the book of life. Amen. Then over the book of Romans, we just turned there, chapter two, Romans chapter two, in verse one. <clears throat> Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgeth, for when thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for, for that thou judgest, uh, thou, <clears throat> thou that judgest does the same thing. No one, listen, no one will ever stand before God and have an excuse for not being saved. Thou, therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. Nobody will ever be able to stand before God and say, it's, it, uh, and blame God. Nobody. Nobody will have an excuse. Nobody will have a reason. To blame God. You didn't, you didn't speak to me. You didn't love me. You didn't let me know. Matter of fact, if you go back and read Romans chapter 1, he says that even if you look at the creation, look at what I've done, how I've created, even that tells you there is a God, but they turned their back on that. Hadn't they turned their back on that? So if somebody were to stand before God and say, oh, I didn't know. He said, don't tell me. He said, you saw the stars. You saw the sky. Uh, you saw the moon. You saw the sun. You saw, the, uh, you saw what I created. And that should have told you something, but you, that's no excuse. Nobody, no one will ever stand before God and say, you didn't give me a chance. No one. You know, a lot of people have the idea, even though uh, it may not be that excuse, they might stand before God and say, you know, uh, uh, I, didn't, I didn't have an opportunity. No. Especially here in the South where we live. Think about how much gospel people hear today. Can you imagine somebody dying without Jesus Christ who, who've been in church all their life, been in Sunday school, know, know uh, that Jesus died, know that he was resurrected, know and know and know and never yet know him they know all about him, know of him, but not know him. 
Uh, many of our children are in the, their classes and teenagers. You as a mom and dad could t- take your son or daughter to the side. A father could take his son aside and say, son, here's what it's like being married. He'd paint a picture, amen? <laughs> amen? And here's a mother, she could take her daughter aside and say, sweetheart, here's what it's like being married. And, and tell that daughter, him tell that son all about marriage and, and here's, you know, here's what it consists of and here's what it's all about. But that child will never know what it is to be married until they what? Get married. And here's the thing about it. There may be some truth to what they heard, but there'll be something different about it. You can hear about people being saved. You can hear about the grace of God, sing about the grace of God, join a church, get baptized, and all those things, and still not know him. And so the point is, nobody will ever be able, God, I went to church. Jesus, I did this and I did that. Sorry, I never knew you. Nobody had an excuse. Nobody. And so I'm glad I'm saved. Praise God for that. And, uh, and then over in Romans chapter 7, if you'll turn there, verse 17, Romans 7, 17, and verse 18. Romans 7, 17. Now then, it is no more I that doeth it, but watch this, but sin that dwelleth where? In me. Now, this is Paul talking. The wonderful, glorious, great apostle Paul. Now, he's talking about sin. He said, now then, it is no more I that doeth it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now, watch verse 18. For I know that in me, that in my what? Flesh dwelleth what? No good thing. For to do will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. If you're going to read the rest of it, he goes on to say this. (laughs) No one can eradicate the flesh. No one can do away with our fleshly desires. No matter who they are. I met a, I met a preacher one time uh, who said that you can live, if you, if you have it, you, there's, there is, you can live and get to a point in your Christian life to where you will not sin. Boy, I looked at him. I said, you actually believe that? He said, oh yeah. He said, uh, I've met some who like that. I said, have you ever attained that? He said, not yet, but I'm working on it. I'm close. I said, well, let me show you something in the Bible. You think you're a better Christian than Apostle Paul? Yes or no? He said, no, I don't think I am. I said, let's turn to Romans chapter 7. (laughs) And Paul says that it's impossible for you as a person to eradicate, to completely never sin. No one can do that. And he goes on to say, he said, you know what? I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't know how to perform it. It's because of my weak flesh. He says, a matter of fact, the things that I should be doing, I am not doing. And the things I should not be doing, I am doing. And both of those are sins. The sin of, uh, the sin of omission, not doing what you should as a Christian, and the sin of commission, what you're doing that you shouldn't do. And then he says, oh, wretched man that I am. You know, that ought to speak to us. Because you got to be careful. You may be uh, more mature as a Christian than somebody else. You may be more grown up than another Christian. But the, listen, the, 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 the percentage of your spiritual growth, listen now, is how you look at other people. Here's what I mean by that. If you ever get to the idea in your own mind, you may not speak it, but in your mind you say, oh, I'm better than they are. That's a sign right there. You're not right with God. Boy, I'm glad I'm not like they are. And the point is, that's why he's talking about we should never judge. And so let's make it a point in reality. We ourselves, we have a problem with our flesh. 
People have a problem with their temper. People have a problem with having a bad attitude. Uh, the least little thing is snap some people. You see, you have a breaking point. You say, what is it, preacher? I don't know, but you know what it is. Get, some behind, get behind somebody driving too slow and find out. Hmm? Ah, I found myself back the last election. You know how they call wanting to tell you who to vote for? I got one of those phone calls. I said, hello, James Baker. Mr. Baker, I'm calling about so-and-so. I said, I am sick and tired of this mess. Leave me alone. Boom. Wasn't that a wonderful testimony? And no sooner I'd slammed that phone down, I, I found myself saying, oh, wretched man I am. He said, Brother Baker, that's funny. It ain't funny to God. We laugh about it. And I'm trying to tell you, your flesh is weak. Weak, weak, weak. That's why you had to do like Paul said. He said, I, I, I buffet myself. I try to bring it under control. And that takes a lot of work to bring your flesh. Under, but you'll never bring it under complete control. You said so there. Boy, what a verse. That's why John said uh, in, in chapter, uh, 1 John 2, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we'll, we'll, if we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Amen. So I want, ain't that wonderful? Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. We're just having a time, aren't we? And no one. Chapter 14, verse 12. All right, you ready? So then, every one of who? Us. Okay, he's talking to Christians. So then, every one of us shall give what? Account of who? Self to God. Every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Mm. No one, no one will be excluded from giving account for their Christian life. You're going to give an account for it, even as a Christian. Amen. No one is exempted. No one is excused. No one is excluded. Everybody's going to have to give an account to God. Everyone. And uh, my point and my question is this here. Are you ready for that? I don't know if I won't say, you know, I, don't, I won't say I am, but I'm not sure I am. And part of me says, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Part of me says, Lord, hold off. I need to get a little bit closer to you. I need to do a little bit more need to be done. And so nobody's going, nobody's going to be able to get, get, get around this being judged part. I'm not talking about the great white throne judgment. I'm talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us sitting here are going to stand before our God one day and give an account for our Christian life. And uh, how we lived, what we did with our life, what we did with our time, what we did with our talents, what we did with our money, what we did, everything we have, where we work, our, our family, how we related to our moms and dads, our kids, our brothers, our sisters, who we work with, our classmates at school, college, wherever it may have been. We're going to give an account to God for everything, everything, everything. Amen. And so oh, let's work at being as clean as we can be. Amen. Don't realize that we'll never be perfectly clean. Because of our flesh. But that's why it's so wonderful to know that in Christ Jesus we're perfect. In Christ Jesus we appear in the eyes of the Father. But our flesh is still weak and dirty and nasty. Amen. So we to turn over if you would to the book of Galatians chapter 1. I mean chapter 3 verse 11. Galatians 3 11. Hmm. It says here, <clears throat> he's talking about the law, the law of God, Galatians 3.11. But that what? No man, there it is, is justified by the what? Law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. Uh, that's Galatians 3.11. Here's the point. No one is justified or made right in God's sight by the law of God. We're talking about the law of God, the Ten Commandments and all the other commandments God gave. Nobody, who, no matter who they are, is justified or that word justified means right in the eyes of God. Nobody. 
And yet there are people by the millions who will say something like this. I'm going to heaven. Why? Well, I try to obey the Ten Commandments. I haven't found anybody yet that I've talked to who obeys the Ten Commandments. I even ask them. They'll say, well, I try to obey the Ten Commandments. I said, really? Let's name a few of them. <laughs> Come find out. Well, that, that's not true. And so the law, it, there's no salvation in the law. The only thing the law can do is make you look bad. Because you are bad. We are bad. The law is a, the law, the Bible says it's like a mirror. We read the law of God and the law says you're guilty. <laughs> you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. That's why folks don't want to read the Bible. It's a mirror. And the Bible, the Bible says about the law, it is our schoolmaster or our school teacher. The law teaches us and shows us what we really are. Sinners, we miss the mark. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. What does that word glory mean? It means perfection. All have sinned and come short of the glory. We, our God is perfect. We miss the perfection of God. I was witness to a man one time. He said, uh, he said, well, I think I hit the mark. I said, really? What mark? He said, the mark. Me and the old man upstairs got it on spot. The old man upstairs. I said, oh, really? I said, well, what's the mark? He said, well, you know. I said, no, I don't. Tell me what it is. He said, well, you know. I said, no, I don't know. I need to know what you're talking about. You hit it on the mark. I said, let me ask you a question. Are you saying that you hit the bullseye? He said, probably. I said, well, all right. Then if you had a, a dart board here and you had one dart and you backed off 100 feet. I just said, let's make it close. We back off 10 feet. And you got a dart board. You got one dart. And the, the center of that bullet, the center of that dart board is the exact same size as the dart head. And I want you to blindfold yourself and throw at that dart. You think you're going to hit the mark? He said, no. I said, you're right. That's the way it is with God too. And I showed him that verse. For all have sinned and come short, missed the mark. But Jesus hit the mark perfectly, didn't he? And Jesus is my dart. He hits the mark every time. Oh, boy. And so nobody is saved by being good because they're not good. Nobody is, is, can be saved by being religious. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be what? Born again. You believe that? Okay. All right. Uh, Colossians, turn to Colossians chapter 1 and uh, <clears throat> look in verse 17. <clears throat> well, let's read verse 16 too, okay? For Colossians 1, 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, notice that thing, all things, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things created by him and for him. Now verse 17. And he, he is before all things and by him all things consist. Hmm. No one, listen, no one can exist without God. He said so right there in verse 16 and 17. Uh, and in him... And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Everything that's in, that's in you and in me and this universe, this planet, it exists because of him. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. And uh, no one can exist without God. That's why, you see, the biggest lie, one of the biggest lies that the devil has ever uh, uh, put forth and believed is this matter of evolution. That man evolved one of the biggest lies out of the pit of hell. And yet it's being taught today and accepted by generations of young people who don't know the Bible, who don't know God, and, and don't, they actually believe that, that they came from apes in uh, some <laughs> amoeba somewhere. Oh, sad, sad, sad. But you can't exist without God. And then we'll hurry along here, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 15.
It says, this is a faithful saying and worthy all, of all acceptation that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Notice that phrase, of whom I am chief. No one is so bad that they can't be saved. Got that? Look at it again. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to what? Save who? Sinners. And Paul said, of whom I am chief. Now, if you look at the life of Paul, all he lived for before he got saved was to imprison and have Christians put in jail or put to death. That's all he lived for. That's all he cared about until he got saved. And Paul is saying here, nobody has gone so far they can't be saved. Aren't you glad of that? I've made this statement probably hundreds of times over the years I've been here that that when somebody you hear somebody say, and I realize it may be, I understand what folks are trying to say by this. They say, oh boy, uh, when I, was, I was deeper than anybody else when I got saved. I was way down deep in sin. And they're talking about how, how bad their life was, okay? But the truth is, the grace of God found every one of us in the same stinking mud hole. No one is any more deeper in sin than anybody else. Because in the eyes of God, when you're a sinner, you're a sinner. When you're lost, you're lost. Now I realize the Bible says, where sin did abound, grace did what? Much more abound. So Paul is saying, I was the chiefest. And if God will save me, he'll save anybody. So if you, if you know somebody out there that's in your family, you work with or whatever it may be, and you look at them and say, boy, they're going too far. I got news for you. Hey, the grace of God can reach them. Don't quit praying for them. Don't quit encouraging them to come to church or whatever. Give them a track. Invite them to the Lord. Witness to them. Oh, praise God for that. Now listen to this. <clears throat> And uh, I'm trying to keep my eye on the clock because I don't want to keep here all night. I got a, there's a bunch of these. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, all right, go over to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Oh my soul. Hebrews 2, 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard him. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Listen to this now. Uh, <clears throat> no one should neglect salvation. No one. But they do it every day, don't they? I'm glad I didn't neglect it. I'm glad I'm saved. Oh, Lord, praise God for that. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 27. And is appointed unto me and wants to die. But after this, the judgment. We emphasized that a few moments ago. No one's going to escape the judgment. You're going to give an account to God for your Christian life. How you lived, what you did, didn't do. You're going to give an account for it. i got news for it. The judgment seat of Christ will not be a very happy time. All the tears wiped away will come later. When we stand before Christ, our Savior, give an account for our life. It's not going to be a happy time. I want it to be. Oh, boy. And then over in James chapter 3, next book in the Bible, James 3, verse 8. Something's going on next door to kids. They might be then tied all them adults up. <clears throat> James 3, 8. Listen to this verse. But the tongue can what? No man what? Tame. It is an unruly what? Evil, full of what? Deadly poison. The tongue can no man tame. Well, no one can tame the tongue. Is that what it says? That's why, that's why uh, you want to think, think before you speak. You believe that? You know, the Bible says we're going to give an account to God for every idle word. Boy, that's going to get me messed up. Idle words. Amen. No one can tame the tongue. And then the last one. Boy, they're having a time over there, aren't they? <laughs> we have to have a talk with Tommy and Miss Baker, Baker over there. They might be ready to get out. 
First Peter chapter, this will be the last one, okay? Uh, chapter two, verse two. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Here's the point. No one can grow without the Bible. If you're going to grow as a child of God, you've got to have a Bible. Not just have it, you've got to read the Bible. Do you have a daily Bible reading? You're not going to grow if you don't read the Bible. If you, you're, not, you're never going to really grow if you don't study the Bible. Come to church, come to Sunday school, hear the Bible preached, and study your Bible, and, 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 and do studies and things like that. Why? Because you will never mature and grow as a Christian without the Word of God. It's impossible. This is, God's, this is God's bread. This is God's water. This is God's meat. This is God's refreshment. Hey, this, this book is what you need to grow, 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 grow. Amen? Well, I hope these things will help you tonight. Did it help you a little bit? No one. No one. Well, let's pray. Maybe somewhere in tonight in the message, God spoke to your heart about something that you need to start doing you hadn't been doing or stop doing something you've been doing. Whatever it may be, I hope tonight you'll let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And you'll mind the Lord in the invitation. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you tonight, Lord, for uh, enabling me once again to be able to stand behind the pulpit. And Lord, bring the word of God forth to your people. God, I pray that these things tonight we've looked at and we didn't go deep into them, Lord. But I know your spirit, your God, can drive these points home to every heart tonight. And I believe you have. Now bless the invitation. In thy name I pray. Amen and amen. Let's stand to our feet. God has spoken to your heart. Mind the Lord now. Think about this. All the invitations that you've had in your life and God spoke to you and you didn't move. Something else, isn't it? All the sermons you've heard had just one in one, one ear and out the other. Oh my. Pay attention in church. Listen. Let it sink into your soul. No one, no one. No one's going to miss the judgment. No one's going to have an excuse. No one can do enough to be saved or even stay saved. No one. You'll never reach the point of, of perfection until you get to heaven. No one. Don't think more of yourself than what you really are. Humble yourself. Judge yourself instead of others. Are you looking for Jesus to come back? He's coming. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Miss Ruth. All right, Amen. Well, then I've, I've preached a little bit. I'm I'm woke up. I'm not ready to take a nap anymore. Some of you look like you may need to take one anyway. All right, I know some of you had a long day. You've worked hard and you had a long day. Uh, I don't know what it was Monday night or Tuesday night last night. Miss Baker and I got to the house and it just got dark. It was about between six and six thirty. And I'm sitting in the chair, and she said, what you going to do? I said, I'm going to put my pajamas on. She said, now? I said, yeah. She said, what for? I said, what do you normally put your pajamas on for? <laughs> I'm going to bed. So I went to bed between 6.30 and 7, and went to sleep about 11.30. <laughs> oh, boy, I have got up and down, went and did this one, did that, never did go to sleep. All right, God bless you, you're dismissed. We'll see you on Sunday now, okay? Ladies, be here Saturday morning, 11 o'clock.